just continue to worship, man. There's a guy getting born again right here. I couldn't even wait. Isn't that awesome? Couldn't even wait. Couldn't even. Did, I, did you hear me? I said he couldn't even wait. I said he couldn't even wait. I want to do it right now. Right now. I'm tired of being away from God. I want to get it right. Right now. just pray. Let's just pray. Pastor Richard, I can see Pastor Richard out in the hallway praying with this young man. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending this young man to this place tonight. We believe that destiny's journey has led him to this moment. And we thank you for having the opportunity to witness the conversion that's taken place in his life. I pray that this will be forever marked as the greatest night of his life. Lord, that he will walk out of darkness into your marvelous light and never, never, never be the same again. If you believe it, shout yes! While you're being seated, take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 17. I just have faith enough to believe. I believe the Lord was speaking to me when he went out and he said, that young man is a tithe of the people who will be saved in here tonight. You believe that? Let me tell you, if you're not right with God, you're not currently serving God, I want to tell you that God did not bring you here so you can encounter us. Uh, God brought you here so you can encounter him. And I pray that you would look beyond all the things you don't understand and find the heart of God drawing you to himself. This room is full of story after story, person after person that can tell you this Jesus thing is the most incredible thing you will ever come in contact with in your life. Can anybody testify? Some of you don't sound like you're convinced. I said, this Jesus thing is the most incredible thing you will ever come in contact with in your life. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Luke chapter number 17. This is so cool. Cool, cool, cool. 
Thank all of you for being here tonight. We're honored that you took the time to come out on a Saturday night. I know many of you have other church responsibilities on Sunday morning. and It's always an honor and a privilege to be in this church. It's also always, I never take it for granted that you would take the time out of your life to come be here. And so I'm very excited that you're here and that you've made the sacrifice to be here. <clears throat> Luke 17, beginning in verse 11. Luke 17, 11 says, Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him men who were lepers, who stood afar off, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priest. And so it was as they went, they were cleansed. As they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned with a loud voice, glorified God. Watch verse 14 again. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priest. And so it was as they went, they were cleansed. Verse 15 says, and one of them, say one, when he saw, say saw, that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice, glorified God. Say loud. Yee. Fell down on his face and his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, was there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. What a great story, huh? Sometimes I think if we really understood the word of God, we could just read the story and go home. I wouldn't even have to talk about it anymore. Spirit of revelation and wisdom begin to stand up in the people of God, and we stop living vicariously through the revelation that comes to a few specific leaders, and we start living in revelation ourselves. Well, we as leaders have been too insecure to build a people that know how to get revelation on their own. We just want you to be drawn to our revelation, because heaven forbid you might come to church and get confirmation instead of just coming to church to get revelation. God actually did not design the church to be a source of revelation. God designed the church to be a place of confirmation for the source of revelation you got before you ever came into the house of God. So what we've done is we've fallen in love as preachers with the sound of our own voices, and we've not learned how to maximize the potential that is really hidden within the side of the people that God has assigned for us to equip, not fascinate. God did not give apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers so that we would have somebody to clap when we share our latest, greatest revelation. God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping or the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. So if you're operating under true five-fold order, then something should be deposited in your life that is moving you toward manifesting the ministry God intended for you to function in, but you're not going to manifest the ministry God intended for you to function in if you are continually governed by leadership that needs to be the show. So there is a change in order that is taking place within the body of Christ all over the country as God is beginning to raise up leaders who understand the responsibility of being fathers instead of raising up leaders who are fascinated with the opportunity to be famous. Because any legitimate father becomes more fascinated with the development of his seed than he does with the propulsion of his own dreams. And so what we've got to do is we've got to begin to invest in another society of believers that have a heart to do something great for God but have been convinced that God only uses a few specific superheroes to do incredible things and the rest of us are just here to pay for it. Because there's finally a generation that are beginning to step into seats of authority that have genuinely been fathered. We literally had people invest into our lives. Had to do this for a while without people investing in our lives. And then people got around us and said, you know what? I care about your development. How can I help you? So now we are beginning to raise up a generation of people that are coming through current leadership that are not insecure to exercise the gift of God that is within them because they've been qualified by somebody who has been fathered. I know we don't like the concept of fathers and sons because it is a far greater responsibility than clergy and laity. So we love the concept of I'm clergy and you're laity. We hate the concept that I'm a spiritual father and you're spiritual children because then all of a sudden we have to begin to invest a part of our lives that's more than Sunday morning at 10 and Wednesday night at 7. Now, 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 I could spend a great deal of time beating on that drum and talking about how we've got so many insecure leaders that have failed to raise up true, genuine sons and all that. But as much as it has been a problem within leadership, it has also been a problem within the church because we have loved the concept of not having any responsibility. So we have almost fallen in love with being impotent. We've almost fallen in love with the concept that 
we don't want anything to be given to us because to whom much is given, much is required. We don't really want anything to be required. And the way we put ourselves in position to have nothing required of us is to keep ourselves in a position where we receive nothing that may require. So there is an identification issue within the church where most of the body of Christ don't know who they are. They're just fascinated by some people who do know who they are. But God doesn't put people in the church who know who they are so you can be fascinated with who they are. He puts people in the church who know who they are so they can identify who you are. John knew who he was, but his job was not just to know who he was. His job was to identify who Jesus was because he knew who he was. And because John was not in the middle of an identity crisis, he did not have a difficult time identifying Christ. So he could say, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And I'm qualified to know who he is because I know who I am. Wow. Wow. I know I can tell you who he is because I know who I am. And the reason why I don't believe we are confident to point Christ out to the world is because we don't know who we are in Christ. And if you don't know who you are in Christ, how are you qualified to show anybody else who Christ could be in them? We, we, understand, we understand through the teaching of the Word of God and the preaching of great revelation that's come through great men in the past that the earth began, earth began, Authority began to be released on earth to man. The man's name was Adam. It was the beginning of what we've called an Adamic race. The beginning of the Adamic race, it began with Adam coming to earth. Follow me here. If you're going to try to take notes, you better know shorthand. Have smoked pot before you came in here and feel real loose something because you're going to have a hard time keeping up. It's the beginning of the Adamic race. Yeah, get the CD, hit pause, track it back, slow it down. So, so listen, listen, I talk fast. I got, I got 19 sermons got to get in one night, so I'm going to unload it all. Ready? Listen, 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 listen. That's just, this is why you should, if you're a young person called in the ministry, go study homiletics and hermeneutics so you don't end up like me. I release you to go get educated in Jesus' name so you don't end up like me. Listen, listen, listen. So there was the beginning of what we call the Edemic race. The Edemic race began because God sent a man named Adam. God saw that it was not good for a man named Adam to be alone, so he gave a man named Adam a bride. The bride's name is? Eve is the wife of Adam. Eve is the wife of Adam. The enemy comes in, tries to bring division and tries to bring destruction and tries to bring death. The way he does that is by attacking the bride of the first Adam. Jesus came and began what we call the second Adamic race. The Bible calls him the perfect Adam. He was the Adam that was without fault because the first Adam sinned and allowed sin to come into the world and prevented man from being justified and reconciled to God. God had to bring a second Adam that never did sin so he could justify the world and bring reconciliation between man and God. Because the first Adam blew it, God had to bring the second Adam. We understand through Scripture that the second Adam was not a plan B for God because the Bible says he was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. So the attack of the enemy against Eve did not force God into a plan he did not originally have. It just allowed the devil to pay for the plan that God originally had. The cross was the plan of God facilitated by the working of the enemy. And if you can quit whining about what you're going through, you can understand that God is trying to promote you and the devil is paying for your promotion. First Adam comes, he's given a wife because God said it's not good for the first Adam to be alone. Second Adam comes, God's also convinced it's not good for the second Adam to be alone, so he gives the second Adam a wife. The bride, a companion named Eve. Second Adam gets a bride, a companion named the church. Now, if we understand and if we believe that the enemy has no power to create, simply to pervert that that's already been created. One of the things that's supposed to separate the church from the world is we are a creative force while they are a mimicking force, yet we've allowed our roles to reverse and we have become mimickers of people who are not creators. So we are just like the world in our music just four years late. Right? Right? We let them set the standard, and we spend our lives trying to catch up to what they're doing. And people say, well, when y'all doing church, that looks like the same thing that you see on MTV. Where do you think the concept of MTV came up? Who came up with that? The devil has no power to create. He didn't create the concept of MTV. He took what he saw at the holy place. So what you see when you go to a concert that looks like what you see when you come in here to church tonight and you say, that looks like just like the world does. I want to tell you that the enemy has no capacity to author. He only has the capacity to pervert that that's already been authored. So it could be when you're watching teenagers jump up and down and go wild and crazy and sling and sweat and spinning around in circles and crying out because they fall in love with a rock star that the enemy has put an illegitimate idol in the place of a genuine God and caused them to freak out over something that's not worth freaking out over. 
enemy has no power to create. If he has no power to create, and the way he gets the first Eve to fall is by saying, if you eat the true fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God. He gets the first Eve to fall by trying to convince her she's not who she already is. If you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will open and you'll be like God when the Bible already said that Adam and Eve were created in the image and likeness. So she was already like God. So he tried to get her to strive to be something she already was. And I believe because the enemy has no power to create, he's trying to get the bride of the second Adam to fall the same way he tried to get the bride of the first Adam to fall, and that is by keeping the bride of Christ from seeing that she is like God. That the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead has quickened your mortal body. That he's given you all things that pertain unto life and godliness. That he is the firstborn among many brethren. The earth is groaning and travailing for the manifestation, not of the Son of God, for the manifestation of the sons of God, for people who have risen up under genuine authority and have the capacity to release the kingdom into the earth. And when you step into a moment of worship like this, what we, what we have to be careful of is that when we get into a tight place in worship and it doesn't feel like it's flowing the way we would like for it to flow, the enemy will try to get you to say, will try to convince you that you need to begin to effort. You need to begin to strive. You need to begin to work within your flesh to try to produce something instead of you getting the revelation that all you got to do is release who you are. When you release a roar, what you're doing really is releasing who you are. Ooh. Do you know that they used to believe that the smallest particle of matter was a molecule? Then they broke the molecule down and they found out that the, they thought the smallest particle of matter was an atom. Then they learned to break the atom down and inside of the atom, you know what they found? A sound wave. So they used to believe it was a molecule, and then they broke it down and found out it was not a molecule, and then they used to believe it was an atom, broke it down and found out it was not an atom, that an atom was actually sound, and that makes sense because God said, let there be, and it was actually his sound that caused matter to be created. In you, in your voice, is a creative force. The power of life and death is in the tongue. And when you begin to lift your voice and cry out to God, things in the earth begin to respond to somebody that when they talk, it's like God talking. Isn't this something? We've got 10 lepers that are standing outside of the gate of the city of Samaria. And then the Bible says something here that is just absolutely awesome. The Bible says that he went... Watch this. Now, it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Understand that you do not have to go between Samaria and Galilee to get to where Jesus was going. He went out of his way to collide with people in trouble. The church for years has gone out of her way to avoid people who are in trouble. One of the reasons why is because you do not have the capacity to have a heart to help somebody else get delivered unless you get a revelation of the deliverance that's happened in you. How do you help somebody else get free from what they're free from if you continually have to come to revival every month to try to get free from the same stinking thing over and over again? I'm believing for a breakthrough. Get a breakthrough and move on. That's why this, this misconception of who we are has birthed this conference. I'm trying to say a nice word. This conference foolishness that we've got women's conferences, we've got children's conferences, we've got single women's conferences, we've got married. I don't know that I've been in a church in the last year that did not host a women's conference. I mean, got to have a women's car. And I can tell you who they're going to invite to preach at it. Women's come. This is what we got. You got to come. So we got people buying airplane tickets, flying from church to church to church, trying desperately to get a word that will bring a breakthrough instead of developing a relationship that will bring a breakthrough. 
You can come in here and jump up and down until you lose your mind, but you're still going to have to go home and make up your mind what you're going to do with what Jesus has made available to you. What do you want to do with it? Breakthrough. I need a breakthrough. I need a breakthrough. I need a breakthrough. And so we spent years raising up people who believe if I get in the right atmosphere and if I stay there long enough and if I come often enough, then all of a sudden I'm going to continue to live like I'm living. I'm going to mind my own business. And one day, abracadabra, I'm free. But you have got to begin to get a revelation that Christ in you is the hope of glory. And when you do, then all of a sudden you begin to make a withdrawal on the greatest deposit that's ever been placed in you, and that is the Christ in you. You know, the Bible says to work out your salvation through fear and trembling. We were foolish enough to believe because we have a misunderstanding of, of how, how, how the Scripture was perverted in places because when King James was translating the Bible, some of that stuff sounded like a heretic to him. So he said we were made a little lower than the angels. The original did not say we were made a little lower than the angels. The original said we were made a little lower than Elohim. But he was afraid to say we were made a little lower than God, so he said we were made a little lower than the angels because that sounded better than him. And then the Bible begins to give us instruction that we have the capacity to command the works of the hands of the angelic, and we're afraid to do that because we're a little lower than them. Isn't it crazy? And, and, and so, you know, what we did is we took the phrase to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, and we let people believe that that meant they got to define their own morality. Work out your own salvation for fear and trembling. It might be sin to you, but it's not sin to me, so you might can get away with watching porn, and I can't get away with watching porn because I'm just working out my own salvation through fear and trembling. We just get to make up our own rules. That's not what the word actually meant. The word, if you break it down and, and look at what the original meant, the Bible says if you could get the salvation that's in you out of you with fear and trembling. So work out. Work the salvation that's in you out of you with fear and trembling. There's something in you that is desperately desiring to get out of you. And at that moment, you begin to get a divine revelation of the deposit that's been made on the inside of you. There's a God in you trying to get out. What is a word of knowledge is when the God in you starts to get out. What's a word of wisdom when the God in you starts to get out? What is it when you prophesy? It's when the God word that has already been deposited on the inside of you begins to find an outlet. Jesus goes on purpose through an area that is notoriously full of lepers because he had confidence that the thing that was on the inside of him was more significant than the thing that was eating at the outside of them. The thing that is on the inside of him was more significant than the thing that was eating at the outside of them. And when you get the revelation that greater than he, you got it. That can't be a cliche, a catchphrase, a favorite verse. It's got to be revelation. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And when you get that, now all of a sudden you do not want to avoid opportunities to collide with people that are in trouble. You look to create opportunities to collide with people who are in trouble. Jesus sends his disciples away to get food so he can put himself in position where he can collide with a whore at a well. Five husbands shacked up with another one. Go on, boys. Now we... The first rule of leadership is that you don't be alone with a woman, especially a woman with that kind of reputation. But he was so confident that what was in him had the capacity to transform her that he could get around her without having to wonder if he would want to get in bed with her. He knew he could get around her, and she would want to get intimate with him. So. And we've kept ourselves away from the very people we are intended to reach. And the reason why we've done that is because they are far more infected or confident over their infection than we are. So we don't want the little crack baby in the nursery with our kid. Baby might have AIDS. 
take our kids out of any environment where they may encounter anything besides God. I think one of the reasons our public schools are in such trouble is because we took all our Christian kids and locked them away in their own school. I don't have anything against Christian school because most of us know Christian schools are full of just as many lost people as public schools are. It's kind of like drug rehab. If you want to go to get drugs, go to rehab. <laughs> you want to go get in trouble, go to Christian school. <laughs> it's all the people that got kicked out of regular school, you know. We want to make sure that we want to make sure we want to make sure we want to make sure that we're not friends with the world. Come out from among them. Be ye separate. Be ye holy even as I'm holy. Come out from among them. Come. And so what we've done is we failed to, rep to understand that God removed us from the world so that we could assault the world with the kingdom by being outside of. So now by faith, Moses, when he has come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer reproach with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season for he had respect unto the recompense of his reward. By faith, Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he had endured as seeing him who is invisible. Moses has a choice to make. Do I choose Israel or do I choose Egypt? In the day and the life and the times of Moses, Israel had nothing. Israel was broke. Israel was in captivity. Israel was in slavery. Israel had nothing. Egypt was the wealthiest nation in the history of the world during the days and lives of Moses. One of the reasons why they were so wealthy is because they had covenant people working for them. It's hard not to be successful when you got Israelites making your bricks. Because God's got to touch and bless and prosper whatever the Israelites put their hands to. So they're here. They're making stuff, and Pharaoh's getting richer and richer and richer. And Moses one day has to look and say, by virtue of my adoption, I have complete, unlimited, absolute access to Egypt. I, by covenant with God, have complete, absolute, unlimited access to Israel. One looks like it's got nothing. The other looks like it's got everything. But Moses did something every believer's got to do, and that is he had to deliver himself from Egypt before he could deliver Israel from Egypt. So what he was really doing was getting himself out first. Not so he could get himself out and be scared if he went back, he would be enticed back to wanting to be an Egyptian again. He got himself out because it was his purpose to get others out. And what we've done in the church is we are so self-involved that we're glad to be out and waving our finger at everybody who's still in. What God didn't get you out so you could judge people that were still in. God got you out so you could be acquainted with the sufferings of people that are still in captivity. And that is where genuine evangelism stops being mechanical and starts being anointed. You don't hand out tracts because you feel guilty that people are going to hell. You reach out to people because you understand that if it were not for the grace and mercy of Almighty God, I would still be in the exact same shape. But the, pro the, the problem is it is difficult to get people to invade a world that is full of demonic activity and full of hell and full of the plan of the enemy when they're not really convinced that they are full of God, full of the anointing, and full of the purpose of God in their life. So we are convinced that the world is massively infected with what they are infected with, and we're not quite as convinced that we are I as infected with God as they are infected with the world. But when you get more addicted than the crackhead, when you get more intimate with God than the prostitute is with John, right, then all of a sudden you begin to understand that the reason why I'm allowing God to do something enormous in my life is because I have an assignment to help facilitate God doing something enormous in somebody else's life. Isn't that awesome? Jesus goes through Samaria and Galilee to get to Jerusalem. The reason why he went that way is because he was designed to encounter people that would die if they didn't meet him. You're not on that job to make money. God showed us in the Bible, if he want to give you money, he can let you go catch a fish, open up the fish's mouth and pull money out of the fish. God didn't give you that job because he needed to find a way to get you money. God is not intimidated with the concept of getting you pieces of paper that have numbers on them. Right? If he can say, let there be light, and light can run out of his mouth at 186,000 miles a second, and light is still running out of his mouth at 186,000 miles a second because he didn't say, let light stop, he said, let light be, then believe me, he's not intimidated with getting you a $100 bill. God puts you where he puts you because he wanted you to be in an environment where your light would be most effective. And when we begin to get this revelation, then we quit coming to church to lock ourselves in the room and to, and to thank God we're not like them. 
And we start understanding, you know what? God's done enough in me. I can do something in somebody else. God's done enough in me. I can open up my mouth and tell somebody. The Bible says Jesus at the Last Supper, the Bible says in supper being ended, Jesus girded himself with a towel and began to wash the disciples' feet. He knew when it was time for him to stop eating and start washing. The church has never figured out when it's time for us to stop eating and start washing. Come to church to get slain instead of come to church to get equipped. So that the pinnacle of the Christian experience is now if I can, they can be anointed enough to knock me on the floor when they pray for me. There's a generation of people who are not fascinated with falling down. They're fascinated with being equipped. They're fascinated with walking out of here and going home and laying down tonight and having a dream and a vision about somebody that's on their college campus and they go tell them, last night I saw you and this is where you were and this is what you said and this is what you were doing. And there's finally a generation of leaders who understand their responsibility to equip people. And those of us that operate prophetically have a massive responsibility not to tell you what God's saying but to teach you how God lets us hear. God did not give prophets to the church so they could read palms. God gave prophets to the church so they could circumcise ears. Huh? So you could have eyes to see and ears to hear instead of rallying around somebody that has eyes to see and ears to hear. Instead of having to get on a plane and fly and get a word, you could understand that you didn't get around prophetic people so you could get a personal prophecy. You got around prophetic people so you could get an ear to hear and an eye to see, and you wouldn't have to live your life codependent, hoping somebody hears God for you. You would understand that God can teach you how to hear for yourself. But, well, the, but see, if you're insecure and you don't know who you are and you're prophetic, you don't want other people to be able to do what you can do because there goes your job security. I'm just talking. I was just rambling here today, right? For some reason, I took a text. It just makes me feel more secure. It's like my safety net. In case I run out of stuff to say, I just go back and preach the story. He goes through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Why does he go through the midst of Samaria and Galilee? Because he was built to encounter people who were jacked up. You thought you were going to college because it would help you make more money. You were going to college because it would help you get in a job with a bunch of people who were jacked up. I don't care if you're working at Walmart. I don't care if you're a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. You are where you are because there's something on the inside of you that the people around you desperately need. If not, friend, listen, I know this messes you up. If not, the best thing that happened to you is for you to die right after you get saved. If the pinnacle of your Christian experience is going to be your salvation, the best thing that can happen to you is for you to die between the altar and the way back to your car. God didn't do what he did in you so you could live vicariously off what happened to you in 1987 at 4 o'clock in the morning when I was watching PTL. God did what he did in you because he set you up to become the kind of person that can manifest the kingdom everywhere. Isn't that awesome? Manifest the kingdom everywhere you go. Isn't this fun? Isn't this fun? He goes to the midst of Samaria and Galilee. He encounters a bunch of lepers. Now, we've talked about Jesus' role as responsibility when he encounters these lepers, but I'm also fascinated by these 10 guys. I'm fascinated by these 10 guys because I understand the Talmud or the religious law of their day required whenever anybody passed by them, they were three times supposed to cry, unclean, unclean, unclean. Anybody that's not a leper, you see them coming, unclean, 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 but all of a sudden they see Jesus coming, and instead of crying unclean, 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 they cry, son of David, have mercy on me. That's not what the rules say you're supposed to do. Unclean. It's not hard. One word, three times, unclean, unclean, unclean. But they understood that following the rules had sealed their fate. As long as you keep following the rules, you're going to keep being eaten alive by the thing that is on you. You know what, you know what, you know what, we got people in our churches that are being eaten alive because we're still doing three fast songs and three soul songs and a poem and a sermonette and watching our watch to make sure we get you out by 12 because God forbid that a leader would become secure enough that he would deliver the word of God to you and not be worried if you came back next week. You know when God really started using my ministry? When I quit preaching to be invited back. I go into a church and I preach, and, and, and I think, now, if these people invite me back, they're for real. Because I don't know how to water this down. I don't know how to put, I mean, when I started preaching on TV and I thought, this is a one-shot deal. There's no way they're going to have me back twice. So I just unload the whole thing. Pa, 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 pa. And, then, and then they say, oh, my God, we want to give you your own program. I'm like, do you hear what I'm saying? I'm talking about you. He 
hit me again, prophet, hit me again. All right. <laughs> but people understand that if we keep going in the direction that we're going, we're going to keep getting the same thing we've been getting. Somebody has got to be willing to say, you know what? Following the rules is going to make me die with what's eating at me. I know you're not supposed to come to church and behave the way that we hate behave, but some of us, if we'd kept following the rules, the thing that was eating at us would have killed us by now. I wasn't built for normal. I, I don't do well within normal. I would, not, I, I would not be able to attend church to ease my conscience about my life. I got to get in the glory of God, man. Woo! I got to live in the presence of God. I got to be somewhere where there's power. If he said the works that he did and greater works I got to do, then I got to do the works. I can't, I, I can't come up with some kind of manipulated, molested, raped theology that fits why this stuff's not happening. I got to have it. I got to have it. And people come out, God doesn't move like that anymore. You came by too late to tell me that. If you don't tell me God doesn't still do miracles, you should have got to me before I got an office full of reports of diabetics that have been healed, cancer victims that have been healed, blind people that have been healed, deaf people that have been healed. You, you're too late to try to make your theology override my experience. Walking through Samaria and Galilee, he encounters these lepers. When he encounters these lepers, these lepers, in concert, start to break the rules. Because you know who made the rules? The people who made the rules were people that should have had the power to heal them. But because they didn't have the power to heal them, they had to create a law that kept them away from them. And I think because the church hadn't had power to deliver people, we've wanted to keep alcoholics away from us. Oh, Lord, Lord, Lord. Because we hadn't had the power to deliver people, we want to keep the strippers away from our lust-infected husbands. So they're not welcome here because... Am I preaching good? Am I, am I... I have to write myself a check in just a minute. Money cometh. I'm going to throw it right on up on the platform. I'm good. Listen. <laughs> you come up here and throw a check up here, I'll break your leg in Jesus' name. I'll heal you afterwards, but I'll, that stuff makes me want to puke. Listen, 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 listen. Moving right along. Listen. I don't know what happened. I don't let your left, right hand know what your left hand is doing. And we come running, raving our check now. <laughs> I was at a conference the other day where your, your seating was predicated upon the amount of money that you sowed when you were registering for the conference. I said, I'm, y'all either going to have to refund somebody's money or I'm up out of here. When I found that, I said, I'm gone. There is no way I'm getting in the middle of something God's about to judge like this mess. It's fun. So anyway, so that's why I don't have but a couple of friends. I'm loyal to my friends, and people think, well, he's a great friend. It's not that I'm a great friend. It's just I only have two. It's not hard to maintain. <laughs> I had a man that pastors a humongous church in Ohio, humongous, crazy church, and he invited me several years ago to come be his youth pastor. He said, I want you to be my youth pastor. I said, Pastor, you know, he had, at the time he had a little over 3,000 kids in his youth group. He said, I want you to come be my youth pastor. I said, dude, I said, you don't want me to be your youth pastor. I said, I will grow your youth group down to three people. From, I could take it from 3,000 to three in a month. He said, yeah, but those will be three of the baddest kids that ever lived in the history of the world. That's how I feel about my friends. I don't have many of them, but there's some tough-skinned, bad jokers, the ones I do have. So, 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 so. People who should have had the power to heal their leprosy because they did not have the power to heal their leprosy said the next best thing is for us not to be reminded that we should have the power to fix their leprosy. And the way we won't be reminded is we will get them outside of the city and put them in a place where they are not a constant reminder that we should be anointed enough to fix them. Jesus was built to encounter people that religion does not have the capacity to fix. Jesus set himself up to be the one that can set you free when tradition cannot. So the rule said, cry unclean. Jesus knew when he started walking toward them that he was going to put them in position where they could follow the rules and live or they could break a rule and die. I am not talking about rebellion. I'm talking about determining what is the plan of God and what is the traditions of man. 
Do you know that the Pharisees traveled 100 miles from Jerusalem to Galilee to hear the greatest preacher that ever lived in the history of the world deliver a message, and when they got there, they missed what he said because Peter didn't wash his hands before he ate? Peter's inability to follow the rules caused them to miss the message that was manifesting the kingdom. How be it your disciples do not wash their hands before they eat that is keeping with the tradition of the elders? This guy's saying, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And all the, all the stuff he's preaching, all they can do is miss what he said because they are too wrapped up in his followers' inability to be politically correct. You know how many people miss God because they don't know what to do with the actions of his followers? You know how many people have used Jim Baker and Jimmy Swaggart as an excuse not to serve God? It's 2005, dude. Get over it. You are seven. Get a grip. You know what I'm saying? Well, I just, I was hurt. You, by who? You don't know them? How you get hurt by a TV personality? Brad and Jen broke up, but I didn't cry. Right? Nick and Jessica on the splits. I'm okay. I don't know them. I'm so wounded and I'm so hurt by all these people that let me down. You don't even know these people. You might not let me down. This one failed and that one. Let me tell you something, friend. You got to, do, you got to make the decision about what you're going to do with God and not what you're going to do with people. And if you keep confusing God with people, you're going to be jacked up your whole life. If you keep thinking Peter is Jesus, you're going to always miss Jesus looking at what Peter does. Forget about whether Peter's washing his hands. You didn't walk 100 miles to hear Peter. You walked 100 miles to hear Jesus. He didn't wash his hands before. I don't give a rip what he does. I didn't come to hear him. I came to hear Jesus. And Peter's not healing people walking on water, casting out devils, and splitting stuff up, and, and, and multiplying bread, and turning water into wine. Jesus, I came to hear Jesus. And so you look at what's going on in the surface like this, you may not understand. I ask you to be mature enough to overlook us and see if you can see Jesus. I don't, I don't know why this dude worships like this. I don't get it. I don't really understand this. I don't know. I don't know. It's not important to me. He stands right here, but I can, do, I can make a decision. Either I am going to psychoanalyze why this dude worships like he's on LSD, or either I'm going to find Jesus. I don't understand this. I, I remember when I first met Sarah. Y'all know Sarah, youth pastor Sarah. I first met Sarah. I didn't understand. That, uh, she do, uh, I mean, I was just like, she's going to hurt herself. Somebody put a neck brace on that girl before she just blows something out. She starts shaking. She started, but I knew one thing when I got around her. I remember one time I was thinking, I wonder why she's shaking like that. And then as soon as the thought hit me, I thought, my God, I'm shaking like that too. It's not important to me what the people of God are doing. What's important to me is what God's doing in the middle of what the people of God are doing. Unclean, unclean. You know, we can do that. We do that, and we've been doing that. And, I, I, you know, I've been crying unclean for years, and I hadn't gotten any better. I think we'll try something different, boys. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, now I'm telling you that if you don't follow those rules, they can kill you. You're dying anyway. One way or another, you're going to die. Do you want to die now? Do you want to die later? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 14 says, so when he saw them, he said to them, this is so cool, go show yourselves to the priest. And so it was as they went, they were cleansed. I got you to repeat this because I need believers to begin to understand that historically throughout Scripture, movement preceded manifestation. As they went, they were cleansed. He gave them a word with absolutely no proof, but when they moved on what they heard, it began to change who they were. I almost feel like a faith preacher for a minute. When you move on what you heard, it will begin to change who you are and what you're dealing with. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Psst, psst. I used to preach all the time in church. I used to preach all the time. Jesus will never ask you. God will never ask you to do something you can't do. And then I started reading the Bible. I found out the Bible's full of God asking people to do stuff they can't do. He'd tell blind people to see. I can't see. You, you can if you'll move on what you heard. 
He'll tell deaf people to hear. Told a man with a withered hand to stretch out his hand. <laughs> Sorry, great idea. What, wonder why I didn't think of that. But one of the things that makes God who he is is his ability with a word alone to allow you what you could not do if you did not have a word at all. So the, the disciples spend all night fishing, can't catch anything. Jesus shows up with one word, tells them, cast your net on the other side of the boat, throw their net on the other side of the boat, and bring in such a great drought of fish that the nets can't even contain the fish that they call. What is up with that? He showed them that you can try with all of the effort you have, with all of the experience. There should have been some level of fishing success with the disciples, if nothing else based upon experience. But they found themselves in a situation where that was not by might or by power, but by my spirit. So God shows up and enables them to do with a word what they could not do without a word. That is why you can't just come to meetings like this, hear messages like this, and get excited. I, when I come into a, a word that I know is for me, I take a CD. I devour it. I let it become part of the fabric of who I am. I let it get in me. I meditate on it. I meditate on it. I, I, I know it may mess with some of you. I chant it. That time, I, I'm going to teach you that, that, that these Eastern religions didn't come up with these concepts. Meditation and chanting, that's kingdom talk. That's kingdom talk. I say it. I mull it. I mummer it. I wake up in the middle of the night saying it back to myself. When I believe that God is speaking something to me, I allow it to become part of the fabric of who I am so that I marry myself to what God said, even as I have married myself to who God is, because I understand that God esteems his word above his name. Go show yourself to the priest. If we go show ourselves to the priest, they're going to kill us. We're not even supposed to go back inside the city gates, and you're going to tell us to go show yourself to the priest. But when they moved on what they heard, it began to change the situation they were dealing with. There are too many people that are not doing great things for God because they got situations in their life. But if you would move on what you're hearing, it would begin to change what you're dealing with. I can't witness to anybody I'm still dealing with. If you would move on what you heard, it would begin to change what's going on in you. I can't give a word of knowledge. I'm dealing with this situation. If you would move on what you heard, it would begin to change what you're dealing with. If you're waiting to get everything in your life just right before God uses you, that's going to be a long wait. You know, it, what, one of the things that I found is fascinating is, is, uh, is and I'm not big into numbers because I'm not big into, you know, 85% of people do this and, and one in three people because I have never met anybody in my life that's ever been polled on anything. The numbers say 85% of people, now that I've completely slammed the concept that I'm about to teach you, 85 <laughs> 85% of people who are one to the Lord in one-on-one -on -one evangelistic situations are won by people who have been saved for less than 12 months. I believe that number. I believe that number. And a lot of us is because we had so many unsaved friends. So did you quit being their friend? Or did they all get saved? I'm having a hard time with they all got saved. Or either this room is full of people that didn't have very many friends. Because <laughs> if all the friends you had that were unsaved got saved, <laughs> we probably have to build another building. What happens is, we begin to buy into this concept that there's a greater call on our lives than witnessing. That, that our idea of ministry somehow gets connected to pulpits and microphones. So we say God's called us into the ministry and we quit ministering to the people on our job because we start dreaming about television cameras and pulpits and microphones and conferences and airplanes and websites Business cards and mailing list and product, and that's who it we're called to. And we, as long as we continue to teach the church world that the pinnacle of success is what we as leaders do behind these pulpits, we are going to rape them of their real purpose in God. As long as we continue to say, this is who you are behind this thing when you're really a man and woman of God, and that's who you are when you're not really a man and woman of God, then we're going to cause people to miss the opportunity they have on their job every day, teach kids to miss the opportunity they have on their high school campus every day, teach people to miss the opportunity they have when they're buying gas at the gas station. We have got to begin to understand that the gifts of the Spirit were built to function outside of the church more than they were ever built to function inside of the church. 
church. That's why these signs are for the unbeliever, yet we want to get together and have a signs and wonders party in the church. This stuff works better out there. And I'll be honest with you, I don't want anybody prophesying over me in here that wouldn't prophesy to somebody in the grocery store. Any dummy can do it in here. Right? Anybody can have a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge in here, but if you're not doing it out there, I don't believe you're qualified to do it in here. Wow. Isn't this fun? When you begin to move on what you hear God saying, I'm saying this because there is a prophetic opportunity for harvest within this body that I have never seen here in the years that I've been coming to this church. You better hear what I'm saying. You don't believe it? A dude ran up to the front tonight to get saved, no message, no altar call, and a tough night of worship. And he ran up to the front, got to get, why? Because we are in a moment where I believe God is asking his people, what will you do with my word and this moment? The earth has never been looking to heaven like the earth is looking to heaven now. If Katrina hadn't done anything else, the earth has never looked to heaven the way the earth is looking to heaven right now. If Ivan didn't do anything else, if 9-11 didn't do anything else, if a tsunami didn't do anything else, one thing it's doing is making people begin to look for answers. So if the church has ever needed to get aggressive, Pastor Richard called me. I came into the city. He left a message on my cell phone. People are getting saved. We got people getting saved every week. We got baptizing people. You're going to see an incredible miracle baptismal service in here in the morning. The, let me tell you, I travel enough to know the numbers don't add up. The number of people who are getting saved in this church right now compared to the number of people who attend this church is absolutely out of whack. It's not supposed to be happening. So I'm really here to tell you, if there's ever been a moment in your life you need to collide with some lepers, it's right now. If there's ever been a moment in your life you need to collide with some people who are in a desperate situation, it's right now. If there's ever been a moment you need to take God's word and move with what God's saying, it is right now. Now is no time for you to sleep through another heaven moment. There's a moment of harvest right now, and I'll tell you this. I want to tell you this, it's not, some, it's not something happening nationally. And I know of two churches in the nation who have stepped into this prophetic moment of harvest that we've been talking about in the church since I was a kid. Harvest time is coming, reapers in his hand. I was like nine years old the first time I heard that song. Harvest time is coming, never did come. Because the Bible didn't tell us pray for harvest time to come, it said pray for laborers. Four more months and then come with harvest. Say ye not four more months and then come with harvest. I say unto you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields that are already wide into harvest. Pray ye therefore not for the harvest, not for the rain, not for the field, not for the soil. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest would raise up labors who would go forth into the harvest. There's a church in California that I'm a part of right now that began to step into a moment like this. God began to, I go there once a month. I go to this church in California once a month. Listen to me. As of last month, before we did the meeting, some 70 people got saved through the weekend of meetings. 910 people completed a class that that leadership had to design for people who had never been a part of a church or repeated the sinner's prayer. 910 and 10 people from January to up to the beginning of November. I went to the church two years ago, and there wasn't 400 people in the entire church. They, they, they found an 1,800-seat facility to move their growing church into, and harvest exploded so fast that now they're going to use it for their college and career. Two years ago, they had 400 people. They said, we got to get a new facility. We're doing four services a weekend. we got to get a new facility. We found an 1,800-seat auditorium to move our church into. The harvest so began to overtake this church that now the building that they thought they were going to move their church into is the building they're moving the college students into that are getting saved from Fresno State like the... They're, get, they're not just getting saved at church. They're getting saved at class. They're getting saved at lunch. They're getting saved on the campus. They're driving to the church in the middle of the day and saying, what is going on in me? I need to get right with Tell you, I believe God lets us see things like that, Pastor Richard. 
I believe God lets us see things like that so that we can have a picture, something to attach our faith to. There's a window of harvest that's open here at Rochester. I've been coming here for I don't know how long. A long time. Used to come here once a month. Came here, felt like I lived here. February, I thanked God I didn't live here. It's cold here. If you don't know, it's cold here. Bad. Bad. And, and, and I'll come here over and over again. I'll come here over and over again. And you know what we would do? We would come in here and people get touched. They carried the fire back to their church. People were being touched. People were being healed. God was delivering people. God did incredible things. How many of you, God did incredible things in your life during those revivals? But you know what we always talked about? We always talked about a day that was coming where the reaper would overtake the sower. We talked about a day that was coming that we would reap that on which we bestowed no labor. We talked about a day that was coming where the former rain and the latter rain would be poured out all together in one month. We talked about a day that was coming where the policemen would have to direct the traffic because so many people would be coming into this place to get born again. We talked about a day that would come in your life where you would stand up on the lunchroom table in the cafeteria of your junior high school and start telling them what Jesus did in your life until tears started streaming down the face of 12 and 13 year olds who knew they needed to get right with God. We talked about a day that was coming and one of the most ignorant things that you can do is continue to talk about a day that is coming when you're living in the day that is here I said this how many of you saw us on TV Monday night ah, people actually watch that stuff listen this we're on TV Monday night and you know what they said they said tell me what you hear the Lord saying and when the program opened up said, Karen Wheaton, my friend, said, tell me what the Lord is saying. Tell me, I need you to know. We need to know what the Lord is saying to you as a man who hears the voice of God. What's the Lord saying? I said, this is what the Lord is saying to me. Jesus makes a statement that sounds absolutely absurd to me, Pastor Richard. He says of John the Baptist, there's never been a man born of women who's greater than John, yet the least in the kingdom of God is greater than him. Now, I have a problem with that because of all the great men that were born. You t- you're saying Abraham. You're saying John's greater than Abraham who's the father of many nations, who birthed the nation of Israel through his very loins. And you said John's greater. Moses delivers Israel out of captivity. John's greater. We don't hear, we don't hear John doing a lot of great things. All we hear John, all we, don't, we don't even see John doing works. No miracles. All he's doing is preaching, making people mad, and baptizing people. We got Moses, we got Abraham, we got Elijah, we got Elisha, we got Enoch, we got Jonah, we got Samson, we've got David. You understand all of these. We've got Hezekiah, we've got Nahum, we've got all of these great men of God who were used, all of these great prophets, all of these Joshuas, and all of these Josiahs, and all of these great men of God. And then Jesus has the nerve to say, John is the greatest man that's ever been born of women. And I asked God, God, why is why did you call John the Baptist the greatest man born of women? He said, John was not great. Listen to me, John was not great because of what he did. John was great because of the moment he lived in because every prophet that preceded John said that Jesus was coming John was the first prophet to say Jesus is here this moment is not great because of what's coming This moment is great because of what's here. And God is asking you, what will you do with what is available for you right now? There's a moment of harvest. Let me tell you, when there's a door of harvest that begins to become available to you, and you you want to know one of there's many reasons why it comes. One of the reasons why it's coming is because the house is prepared for it now. One of the other reasons why it comes is because you've been faithful to share your story when you weren't in a season of harvest. You planted seed when it looked like nothing was happening, but you did what you needed to do. You were faithful, and because you've been faithful, now this moment is upon you. What will you do with this divine opportunity? I'm telling you, if you've ever got over your need to be popular in the eyes of people, you need to get over it tonight. If you ever need the revelation that God didn't put you on this earth to win friends, influence people, and climb the corporate ladder, you need to get that revelation right now because God is putting you in position to collide with people who are living in desperation, and there is a great favor of harvest that is upon this ministry right now. I've stepped over. you got to recognize. You felt it. I stepped over, and we're prophetic now. We're not just preaching out of the text. There's something that's happening now. You need to know your family... It's time. Your children, it's time. Your spouses, it's time. It's time for the people on your job. It's time for the people in your neighborhood. And if you can get aggressive right now, if you can move on what you're hearing, let me tell you, 
Let me tell you something. I asked the Lord to let me do this last night, Pastor Richard, and the Lord said, you can't do it last night because this is not for the Friday night crowd. I need you to hold this until Saturday night. I said, I don't even know, understand what all that means. I don't care. I just know when the Lord tells me to hold something, I hold it until he tells me to release it. And I heard the Lord tell me that it was my prophetic responsibility to awaken you to this opportunity. You don't need to sit under this if you're not going to do the right thing with it. I'm going to tell you, there's a weight to this responsibility. It's harvest time. I don't, this, this does not have to be your church. You're here for this tonight. That means it's your moment. I don't care where you go to church. I don't care where you go to school. You may live six hours away from here. Come in for these meetings. That's not important. What's important is God assigned for you to be here tonight to hear that there's a prophetic moment of harvest. That if we do the right thing with it, will not end. In three months... Nine months, three years, or nine years. It will be the opening of a floodgate. This church out in Fresno, there's a floodgate that's opening. And they literally have, I believe, stepped into a prophetic picture of what the Scripture went when it said God would open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing there's not room enough to receive. You try to locate property and think, this is plenty big. 1,800 people, that's plenty big. That's plenty big enough for your college group. Got a 3,000 seat auditorium they're about to move the church into. Realize they're probably going to have to keep all four of their services even though they're moving into a 3,000 seat auditorium. How did this happen? It didn't happen because the city finally found out where they were and people started changing churches. It happened because crackheads started coming. It happened because gang members came in and laid bandanas and guns down on the pulpit. It happened because drug dealers came in and emptied, emptied rock out of their pockets, emptied pot out of their pockets, and said, I need to get right with God. It came in because husbands and wives walked down the altar together screaming and crying, saying we were divorced, but we, we said let's give it one try by going in there tonight, and God began to put broken people back together again. That moment is available Friend, listen to me. I am, I am, as far as the text is concerned, I'm about a third of the way through with this message, but I'm not going back to that. This is what the anointing is for tonight. And I know that the Lord showed me to do this, and I haven't done this in so long that I don't even know if I remember how. But we are going to lay hands on you tonight. And when we lay our hands on you, we're going to release you as evangelist. When we say evangelist, you know, the first thing we think of is traveling preacher. That's not what an evangelist is. The Bible gives us a, gives us a uh, scriptural definition for an evangelist by showing us the life of Philip. You know what the Bible says about Philip? The Bible says he did signs and wonders. He preached the gospel, and he was translated from one place to another place, showing us that the evangelist has the ability, oh, Lord, that the evangelist has the ability to go from one realm to another realm without having to have a vehicle. So when we release this into your life, you know what we're going to do? We're going to show you that there are, there are miracles that are going to begin to accompany your life. Do, do you know that if you take miracles out of the gospel, it's not good news anymore? If Jesus could not have done signs and wonders, he could not have gotten himself killed. You take, you take miracles out of the gospel, it's not the gospel anymore. There are things that we were meant to manifest. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. There are signs that are meant to be following the believer. You're going to begin to operate in that. When we lay hands on you, Pastor Richard and I are going to lay hands on you and pray for you tonight. When we, look, I'm, going to, I'm going to say this. Nobody else is going to lay hands on anybody in here but me and him. I'm going to tell you why. And some of you can get offended and you can get huffed up and you can get pouty. You can say, oh, but you're not doing the stuff, so you're not, you're not tonight. You can want to do the stuff. You can have a drive to do the stuff. You can have a burning to do the stuff. But the Bible says, know those that labor among you. And he and I are going to lay hands on people tonight, and I'll tell you why. Because I am getting words of wisdom and words of knowledge in the most obscure places that have ever happened to me before. I'm seeing people get healed on airplanes. I'm seeing people get healed in grocery stores. I am seeing a crazy manifestation of the plan of God. That may be happening in your life, but I don't know that for a fact. So tonight, we are not going to give away anything we don't have. I've had enough people lay hands on me that wanted something they were trying to give to me. You can't give it to me because you want it. You can only give it to me if you have it. Okay? We're going to do this. We're going to lay hands on you. When we lay hands on you, I'm going to tell you there is, there is a boldness that is going to begin to come to you. 
There's a boldness. I'm saying this because I am hearing the Lord tell me what we are assigned to deliver you tonight. There's a boldness that's going to come to you when we lay hands on you and pray for you. You're going to get delivered from the opinions of other people. And you're going to begin to open your mouth. And when you open your mouth, you're going to hear stuff coming out of your mouth. And you're going, my God, where did that come from? Words of wisdom, words of knowledge, gifts of the Spirit, discernment of Spirit is going to come to you. You're going to begin to operate in the prophetic. You're going to begin to operate with boldness. I'm going to pray that God put in you such a drive for intimacy and communion with Him that it becomes the mark of your life. I'm going to pray that you'll be ruined. I'm going to pray watching TV start to make you sick. I'm going to pray listening to the radio start to make you sick. I'm going to pray needing all of these hobbies and all of this foolishness to prop you up start making you sick, and you begin to drive for harvest. You begin to groan for harvest. I'm going to pray a spirit of intercession begin to come on the people of God and we begin to groan and travail for people that are dying and on their way to hell. No. There's a moment here, church. If we do the right thing with where we are, we won't stay here. If we do the right thing with what is available here, there is a soul-winning season that this church is about to step into. And you are about to see people get born again in here in numbers that will absolutely be astounding to you. Understand this. Understand that this did not come to this church because I'm here. This was here when I got here. I'm just here prophetically to announce it. Okay? So you don't think this is me giving you something. something. I'm telling you, it was here when I got here. It was here when I got here. I believe something began to shift in this church when my friend Johnny Jernigan came. I believe when Johnny came, something began to shift in here. I believe that, that after Johnny left, the Lord began to process some stuff, develop some stuff, began to spring some people out of hiding. And I believe that, that, that the purpose and plan of God has brought us to this moment. And God sent me here like John to say he's here. This thing you've been waiting on is here. This thing that ushers you into the next level is here. This thing that will catapult you into the plan. How many of you feel like you're called into ministry in some capacity? So let's release you and ordain you and send you into the ministry, send you into the harvest, send you into the fields, and allow God to begin to use you to shake the world that is around you. What are you going to do tonight? You're going to go on a word. And as you move, it's going to manifest. As you move, it's going to manifest. As you move, it's going to begin to manifest. As you move, it's going to begin to manifest. I pray when we lay hands on you tonight that you get a divine spirit, you get a divine revelation. The spirit of wisdom and revelation comes on you, and you realize that Christ is in you, and he's big, and he's ready to roar. Christ is in you, he's big, and he's ready to roar. And you begin to let that thing out of you. You begin to let that volcano that is already in you begin to erupt out of you. You begin to open the floodgates of the purpose and plan of God for your life. We're getting ushers ready. That's what all the moving around for. If you're wondering, we're bringing the Calvary in tonight. God, I pray for every usher that is going to help us with this tonight. I pray that an anointing would be on their lives that's never been on their lives before. Even as they catch people that are going out under the weight of the glory of God, I pray that things would be finished in them as these ushers help to facilitate you working in their lives. Listen to me right now. Listen to me right now. If you're in here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we can't step over this. We can't talk all night about harvest, release you into the harvest fields and not model it before you right now. If you're in here and you don't know the Lord, you're in here, hang with me, hang with me. We got more ushers than we could ever use, so we don't need any more ushers. So let's hang with us right here. Hang with us. Everybody focus right now. This is a time we need as little moving around as possible. Little moving around as possible. We got plenty of ushers. Listen. If you're in here and you don't know the Lord or you're in here and you've fallen away from the Lord, there's a time in your life you want to serve God, you're not serving God right now. Call it backslidden. You can call it whatever you want to call it. We won't get into a theological dissertation on where you are and where you're not. The fact is if you're not right with God, there's one right move for you. It's called repentance. I don't care if you've never made it or you've made it 800 times. If you're away from God, you need to get back right with God right now. If you're in here tonight and you don't know the Lord or you've fallen away from God and you don't want to leave here tonight with issues of sin keeping you separated from God, then I'm telling you there's one right move for you and it's to the cross. It's to the blood. It's to a Savior that shed his blood so you can have life and life more abundantly. If you're in here tonight you don't know the Lord, you've fallen away from the Lord. 
on the count of three before your pride can tell you not to and before you can worry about anybody else's opinion. I want you to, I want you to listen to anybody else's thoughts about you. I want you to hear the beating of your heart in your chest and your palms beginning to sweat. It's called the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. If you're in here and you don't know the Lord or you've fallen away from the Lord and you say, I don't under, I'm not asking you to join the church. I'm asking you, what are you going to do with what Jesus did on that cross for you? You're in here and you don't know the Lord or you've fallen away from the Lord and you want to leave this place right with God and you're finally to the place you don't care what other people think. On the count of three, before you can care what anybody else thinks, your hands are going up already. On the count of three, before you can care what anybody else thinks, I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. One, two, three, now. Leave them up. Leave them up. Holy Ghost. Leave them up. Come up here, girls. I want to pray for you. Come up here, all, all of you. Everybody that raised their hand, come up here. I want to pray for you. Come up here quickly, 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 quickly. Thank you. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Come on, church. Come on, church. Come on, church. Harvest, harvest, harvest. Clear the aisle. Clear the aisle. There are people needing to come up here. Clear the aisle. Come on, girl. Come on, girls. Come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Just leave them where they are, guys. Leave them where they are, Paul. Leave them where they are. Leave them where they are. Leave them where they are. Thank you, but leave them where they are. Leave them where they are. You're not, this is not supposed to happen on Saturday night, Pastor Richard. These are, your, these are yours. These are yours. These are yours. How old are you? How old are you? 21, how old are you? 23, how old are you? 22, how old are you? 18, how old are you? 21, 22, 23, 18. These are yours, Pastor Richard. These are the ones you wept because you didn't know if you wanted to step away from that generation and take care of their parents. Uh, and the Lord said, because you were willing to step away from them, I'm going to make you a father to more than you ever thought you'd be a father to when you were in youth ministry. I'm going to make you a father. I've declared that over you before, but I see it so clearly on you tonight. I'm going to make you a father to more than you ever dreamed you would be a father of when you were in youth ministry. 29, how old are you? 20, how old are you? 15, how old are you? 13, how old are you? How old are you? See, this is crazy. How old are you? 22, 23, 29, 31, 36. You see what's happening? You see what's happening? You see what's happening? God's given us that generation that's disenchanted with church. God's given us that generation that's seen religion and religion hadn't been able to really step up to the plate. God, we pray that you would send a Rochester First Assembly of God to everybody that nobody else wants. God, send us the outcast of Israel. God, send the lepers, send the prostitutes, send the drug addicts, send the alcoholics, send the abused and the neglected and the raped and the molested, the hurting and the wounded. God, send them here. I want everybody to stand up on your feet, stretch your hands this way. not alone you're not alone you're not alone Whoa. 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 you're why we're here tonight friends you guys are standing up here at this altar you're why we're here tonight Every day of your life that you had to fight was about you not getting to this day, but look, you made it. Every day you thought about quitting, every day you wanted to die was about hell being afraid you'd get to this day. Devil, you lose tonight. They have made it. Devil, you lose tonight. They made it. I asked the Lord for one thing when I came in here tonight, Pastor Richard. I asked the Lord for one thing. I asked the Lord for you, dude. I asked the Lord for you. I walked in here and I, I you said, if I could have just one thing, if I could have just one thing, and I felt like the Lord said, what's the one thing you want? 
And I looked all over this room. And I turned around and I looked at you and I said, Lord, let him find out who you really are tonight. And then I looked over here and who'd you have your arm on? That young man, what's your name? Sago? Spell that for me. Saho, listen. God's got a plan for your life. I know that you may not understand everything that's going on here. You don't have to understand everything. What you do have to understand is God loves you. We love you. And we want to make sure that you make it into everything God intended for you to be. God, we pray right now that you'd take this young man's life and you'd use it for the sake of your glory. Take him and use him, Lord. God, I pray for every one of these young men and these young ladies that are up here in this altar tonight. I thank you that your, your glory is not age-specific, that you'll move on every different age category. And I pray, God, that you continue to cause this floodgate of harvest that's open in this ministry to increase and intensify as days go by. I want everybody in this place, everybody in this place, to do something that I never do. That is repeat a prayer. I never do this. I'm anti what I'm about to do. I have theory, and I would call it theology, but it's not that solid yet. It's just theory right now. As I get smarter, it turned into theology. But theory right now, and I don't ever do this, and the Lord told me, I want you to have them repeat this prayer. I'm like, Lord, I don't know. He said, you just do what I told you to do. You and I will argue about your messed up theories later, but right now you just do what I told you to do.